Good evening. Welcome to tonight's On the Edge with me, Theo Chalmers. Tonight's show is two hours long and live, so if you have any questions for my guests during the show, text them to 87778 with the word edge, a space, and then your name, location, and your message, and we'll try to pick up at any that really hit the mark. They're all charged at standard rate, so why not get ready to text? Before we start, I feel I must issue a warning. On tonight's show, we will be discussing some very sensitive subjects, including the activities of Britain's social services departments, the secret children's courts, the forced removal of children from their parents, often based on the opinions of experts who allegedly receive questionable financial incentives, the subsequent secret forced adoptions, and the alleged serious mental and even sexual abuse of children by those in positions of power. You have been warned. My guest tonight is a former Royal Naval officer who is now partly responsible for the radical newspaper called UK Column, who tours the country speaking to ever larger groups of concerned people, many of them parents, and who has previously been a guest on this show. On that occasion, discussing the secretive charity organization called Common Purpose. Tonight's show promises to be even more revelatory and a lot scarier than that. So I must stress that all opinions expressed by my guest are not necessarily those of the makers of this show or this channel. My guest is Brian Gerrish. What a show we've got tonight. Brian, welcome. Good evening. Very good to see you again after almost exactly a year. It's really weird how it's I'm getting these guests back almost exactly a year after I first booked yeah. them. It was more luck than planning. Yeah. It's incredible. The time's gone very quickly. A lot happening out there. And well, I'm delighted to be back. Well, it was really good to see you. And, and I, uh, as you know, I've seen you at a few other conferences and things, and you're speaking yeah. at the upcoming AV4 as well, aren't you, in March? Yes, which I think is going to be a tremendous event. Ian uh, Crane has done a great job getting those events going. And the enthusiasm and the interest from people attending is, is really tremendous. Plus, we've got a range of speakers, and I think this is, this is a key thing. It's not on one topic. We're introducing all sorts of topics that are happening out there. Well, talking of topics, as you know, last time we spoke about Common yeah. Purpose, and this time I dare say we'll touch upon Common Purpose a bit, but there is another subject that you're intimately involved in as well, yeah. isn't there? Well, this is the subject of what's happening with families and children. Mm. And I've, I've got to say that the only reason that, that I've started to get interested and involved in this subject is as a result of publishing the paper. So UK the, column. The UK column. Uh, the moment that paper and the earlier version, the um, Plymouth and Devonport column, went out, the phone started to ring and you would have principally mothers, but fathers as well, calling us to tell us what was happening to them and what was uh, common amongst the calls was that these people had got to the stage where they hadn't got anywhere else to go. And they'd learnt of us, and the moment they're on the phone, they just want to tell you everything that's happened to them. And I think I mentioned it to you before, that uh, in the beginning, you listen to somebody and you say to yourself, that can't be true, that just can't be true. And then eventually... Um, uh, the first lady came down to see us, so drove uh, 150 miles to come and see us in Plymouth and brought with us um, ring files of documents. And I, I spent the whole day, well in fact I spent a day and a half with that particular lady, and I was just staggered at what she started to show me. And it's not that rare according to It isn't that rare at all. Told me. And what, what is very interesting, it doesn't matter what part of the country uh, the, the calls come from, they will tell you events which usually follow a sort of template. So the people don't know each other, they've never been in contact with each other, they have just suffered an event in their lives. And when I look at that, I can see similarities with other events. And the stories are so horrific that you say, if this is really going on in our society, we have got to wake up and do something about it. And that's why I've stuck with the subject. Some of it is very harrowing. And I must yes. admit, I found it, it difficult on occasions to, to stick with it because you're, you're very often hearing some very dark, tragic stories. And if you're not careful, it can pull you down. 
On the other hand, we are now at the point where we're starting to see people gaining strength from realising they're not alone. Not, not just because they're speaking to us, but because they're in contact with other parents. And is it also perhaps because they're being believed? And they're being believed. That's a, that is actually a very, very good point. Because um, they will tell you that even when they go to their own family, very often the response is, no, this can't be right. You are talking about subjects where it's really challenging people's um, reality, what, what, what they think is real and normal, and what the other person's experiencing. And I've, I've talked about this countrywide, that's England and Wales, but also it's happening in Scotland, and it's happening in Ireland as well. And I took a well, call... In, in the Republic of Ireland? Or... Republic of Ireland, yeah. And Northern uh, Ireland, presumably. And Northern Ireland. But I took a call from a new lady last week who's, who's over on the west coast of uh, Ireland, and uh, uh, I think I'm allowed to say she was very relieved just to be able to talk to somebody who believed what she, what she had to say. And I'll tell you a bit more about that. Yes, OK. Uh, I think the other thing that's important to mention is that a lot of these uh, cases, um, the judges in the cases, mm. well, in, in any event, the courts are secret, but they prevent publication, and you actually get served with lots of injunctions well, preventing uh, publication. Is I th that, is I that think correct? Am I correct in saying Well, that? absolutely right. This is the, uh, I'm going to use the term wickedness of the whole system, is that... Um, under the smokescreen of protection for the child, you are running courts in secret, and therefore decisions are made completely out of the light of day. And that is not a good start. Um, but ba basically, we are seeing constant talks about opening up the courts, <coughs> but, but what they've really done is said, we'll be more open about the judgments made within the courts. Well, that's not open at all. So you say the, re the, the yeah. pathway to that judgment yeah. is still a secret? It's still a secret. The opinions expressed and who expressed them and what evidence was presented? A absolutely. Are still a secret. Is that what you're saying? Well, well that, is, that is the case. Um, and I'm going to say something which will probably shock a lot of people straight away. But it, we know, factually, that court transcripts are interfered with. So even if you end up with a transcript of what went on, uh, it's been edited. And this is a common occurrence. It's regarded as normal practice in some courts. Well, that is truly shocking, if that is indeed the case. It is and true. Obviously the well, Theo, we've, we've, <laughs> we've been together before. And I <laughs> in simply, the nicest possible way, I have I, to say. <laughs> indeed, here in the <laughs> studio. But this is a serious subject. I don't play at the subjects I get involved in. You're dealing with very serious issues to do with f families and children and you've got to go by evidence. And what I find extraordinary is that the evidence of what's being done is there. Now, if I can see the evidence, and if you can show it to um, a legally trained person and they can see the evidence, how is it that the parents can't actually make an impact on the court system? You know, uh, the thing is, I mean, we've, we haven't got any text on that subject at the moment, but I'm sure we would have text from people who would say, but what if the parents are not fit to be parents? You know, what about baby P? What about children who are abused by their parents? Which, of course, does happen. Of course it does happen. And, uh, and I, I'm happy to sit here and say that, although I'm going to say some very tough things about the police and the courts and social services, of course, I'm, I'm not saying that everybody involved is, is a bad person. That's nonsense. Or, but, or that what, every case is... What, is incorrect yeah. where they well, take ch children away from parents. Absolutely true. There are, there are cases happening all the time where there needs to be some intervention and children taken away. However, we, we know because the evidence is there that we are also seeing a large number of cases and I think we are heading into the thousands of cases. We're certainly in the high hundreds what, of cases. per annum? Uh, yeah, per annum where children are being taken away from their families under false pretenses. But, but who are you to decide this, Brian? I mean, with all due respect, who well, we, are you to we, say... Because, we'll, we'll, you know, I've got to have to yeah, ask these absolutely. questions. You know, I've got yeah. to be the devil's advocate yeah. here. Who are you right. to say that these children right. shouldn't be taken away, these thousands of well, children? Well, I'm going to talk about some cases, but we now come into a very interesting area, 
because the law states that I can't talk about these cases. So, so good night from us. <laughs> no, because we can do some things. But okay. this is one of the key bits for the, list, uh, for the viewers to, to understand, is that we have created a system in this country where the state can take people's children away, but we cannot openly talk not only about what happened using names and detail, but we cannot even show the documentation to prove that what we are saying is correct. So, if, if is, I, it, is this a standard thing, or is this because of injunction? Well, this is, this is because of the gagging of the family court system. So this is just w without exception? Without, it, without exception. Okay, but, and, then, but then on top and, of that, there are these injunctions that you get, sir. Well, I, I'm going to hold up a piece of paper for fun, because it's blank on both sides, and that's because in here are injunctions, which I'm not even allowed to show you. Well, you, you're not allowed to show the, the, the screen, are you? You're well, not, I, I you're can't, not allowed to show I, me, even. I can't publish these. No, okay. But, but they are injunctions to me, preventing me telling the truth about <clears throat> what I know has happened to children. And in one case, and I'm, I'm sure good old Plymouth City Council will be delighted to hear, f hear me mention their name, Plymouth City Council got so excited that they gave an injunction before we even got near publishing anything. It was simply as a result of talking to the family so concerned. So they knew that, somehow they knew well, this that is, you were talking to the family? Well, this is where we've got a very interesting system coming up in our, our cities where there is a professional political grapevine that makes it its business to know what people are doing. But the key point is we have got, not just me, there's, um, uh, there's a gentleman been at this game for years called Jack Frost, produced a tremendous book, The Gulag of the Family Courts. Um, Ian Joseph is another man who's been doing a lot of work, produced a book with facts and documents, etc. But when you come to say to people, right, we'd really like to show you what's going on, the secret courts gag us. So you can't present the evidence. But you can talk about cases if you don't mention the names. Indeed, and tonight what I'm going to try and do is get over for, for the viewers the circumstances of cases where I'm going to try and emphasise where you are seeing this template pattern. And all of the cases I'm talking about are real cases. I think you will be very surprised at some of the things I'm going to talk about. But if somebody says, is sitting in their armchair at home and said, well, this is, Brian, this is all very well, where's the evidence? I say, I can't show you the evidence. I brought two files no, not, to be yes. able to say to the, to the viewers, evidence, I could have brought, I could have brought a, a hundred files in. So the evidence is there. But I can't open these and show you on camera because of the gagging through the courts. Now. If everybody in the court was an honest, upstanding, moral person, maybe the system would work. But if you go um, and look on websites that have been tracking corruption amongst the judiciary, for, for instance, we will see that there are judges using rent boys, there are judges swindling, there are judges doing all sorts of things. So what happens... I have to say that this is my guest's opinion. It's, not all, in, it's all in the national press. Okay. Fine. It's Fair all in the if it's in the public domain. If you go and, <clears throat> and put judges and press in Google, you will come up with story after story of improper behaviour by judges. Okay. Now, yeah. if one of those judges is the judge presiding over a family court case in a secret court where he or she has total control over that court, we have brought the families into a very dark, dangerous place because that perverted judge can make decisions which the families have no way of challenging. Is there no appeal? Well, they can appeal, but, but the system is controlled. Okay, uh, I've this, got a, this is where, let me read you, let yeah. me read you some text. I've, I've got one from Sean in Bugbrook in Northamps. Yes. North yeah. And he says, is it true that local authorities get money from central government if they have to take children into care? Well, this is absolutely true. And at the talk I did at um, Alternative View 3 in, in Bristol, I, I put up statistics where some local authorities have been taking millions of pounds. From, from government? Central from government for putting children in, 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 into adoptive or care arrangements. And that doesn't even take into account the amount of money that the barristers and solicitors are 
are um, clawing in on both sides of the case. And if you go through the files and you look at the invoicing, you will see law firms casually saying, well, we'll have another 20,000 on this case, which okay. is all coming straight out of the public purse. They, they are taking public money as if it's sweeties. Well, uh, here's an interesting text from Vinnie in Kent. He says, anything that binds us together, clans, tribes, families, is being destroyed, replaced by controlled bonds, music, sport, TV, etc., all yeah. negotiable. Do you feel that? I, I think that gentleman's absolutely correct. Yeah. Now, somebody else here called Media says, uh, talking about you, he seems to put enough fear into people, go against the government, they will take your kids. He is doing the dirty work for the elite. And somebody else earlier said, yeah. um, once naval, always naval, and he doesn't trust you. So, so how would you get over that? Well, those two, uh, well, I can only say um, all of the talks that I've done, I've been completely open these people are very welcome to speak to people I've dealt with and helped and they can judge on that basis. But I smile to myself because those sorts of remarks are typical of the way society has been driven. We, we, we are now heading towards a sort of Stasi state. We've got 20,000 public sector snoopers. We've got local councils listening into telephone calls now. They have that ability to do that. Devon and Cornwall Police in 2008 had intercepted 53,000 calls and emails. So we are moving towards a Stasi state where people become suspicious of each other. And I have stood up to try and get the truth out and somebody will email in to say, oh, don't trust this man because of what he's doing. This is the, this is the twist that these people are putting on society. I don't earn out of what I'm doing. On the contrary, money comes out of, out of my personal pocket. I spend hours traveling to give talks. I take ridicule and abuse from some people. I still do it because I say I am trying to get the truth out and help people who haven't got anybody to speak for them. So I can take those comments because I know that overwhelmingly I get support from, from the public. Okay, well, let's talk a bit more then about the way that these courts work, shall we? Yeah. So, should we talk about an example without naming any names? Well, um, I think one case, if, if I give a little background, I've had to make some notes here because there's quite a, quite a lot of, of, of different subjects. Um, but one of the first cases that I came across um, was um, uh, to do with a family in Wales. And the story was quite a common one that basically the the girl so i can only call her a girl um went into hospital how old was this girl uh, at the time she was about 12. okay she and she hospital. she was suffering pain a lot of pain and in hospital um it was clear pretty quickly that she wasn't being treated or diagnosed or treated properly and so the mother was for, was faced with a situation where the, da the daughter's in pain, and she's then given very vague diagnosis. She's prescribed a lot of pills. Mother gets worried. The pain continues. The daughter is, is then moved on to another hospital. And in the next hospital, the same sort of vague uh, tr uh, diagnosis and treatment occurs. In fact, there isn't any diagnosis. They don't know what's the matter no, with her. They don't know what's the matter with her. Um, now, in the documentary evidence that I hold, I can, show you, I can show you discharge notes from four different hospitals in which the diagnosis box is completely empty, but, but, a, but um, a drug is prescri prescribed. So there's no diagnosis, but there is a drug prescribed. And in one of those sheets, and maybe on two of them, there's not even any name and address. Now, well, how do you know they're her sheets then? Uh, because because we, we, no, we can link it in via the numbers and in with the other documentation okay. from the hospital in that case. There was a prescription of oral morphine, okay. which was so massive, if the mother had actually given it to her daughter, the daughter would have died. And a, a, ph a pharmacist in one of the hospitals was ab absolutely shocked to see. Now, what did the mother do? The mother started to protest and to complain to the health trust. And what then happened was a doctor 
and you can see it by his own letters, maneuvered into engaging social services. And they then worked to say that the little girl was making the pain up and that the mother was suffering from Munchausen by proxy. Munchausen syndrome by proxy is, she, where, is where people fake uh, diseases in their children or other people rather yeah, than themselves, which absolutely. is Munchausen So you gain, you, you gain uh, sort of recognition out of the suffering of somebody with you. It's been discredited in a lot of cases now, but the, the, the sequence of letters and documents show that. Now, okay. eventually, the mother is beside herself because she's got a daughter in pain who the local authority is still insisting goes to school, and that girl did go to, uh, to school in pain. Eventually, the mother took her to America in order to get a diagnosis, which she did, and the girl was suffering from Zollinger's disease. Now, Zollinger's disease is a multiple perforation of the gut. It's, it, if you like, it's, it's like an ulcer, mini, mini pinprick ulcers. It's intensely painful. I'm told that the pain actually radiates right through your back. When the girl was in America, she was removed from her mother and grandfather with the assistance of the American police by British Social Services, brought back, put in a psychiatric unit, and to cut the rest of the story short, she has never been reunited with her mother. But, but surely the mother would have said, but she's got Zollinger's disease. It didn't matter what the mother said, because you can see in the sequence of written documents that the, the local authority working together with a paediatrician, working together with social services, and a bent court system, no, none of that system was going to pay attention to anything she said. In fact, that system victimised the mother. There is a court transcript where one judge actually says in the transcript that in his opinion, when the girl was taken, i.e. in America, by social services, in his opinion, the mother had not broken any law. Now, if we turn that round the other way, what he was actually saying was the local social services had no right to take that girl. But surely they need a court order. Or sure, yes. But even so, that court order doesn't apply in America, does they it? They actually turned up over there with a passport which was a false passport. What, for the girl? Yes. It well, sounds incredible, this, doesn't it? But all the documentary evidence is there. What do you mean a false passport? It was a duplicate they that was obtained, issued by the passport office. They obtained a passport for that girl under no legal process. Somehow it was wangled out of, of the, uh, the passport office. Passport office with no process. So the passport office always keeps a spare photograph, for instance, and all the other documents. Well, they provided all this. The other thing that they did is they put an advert in the paper saying the girl was missing when they knew perfectly well where the girl was, was in America with her mother. It, now, I mean, it's, beyond, it's beyond belief. Well, this, your isn't reaction it? Is, is wonderful because yours is a typical reaction. It's beyond belief. Now, so, so that, if when, we when they were, brought this girl back, surely the mother attempted to get access to her daughter again. Yeah, but all that happens is that the social services maneuver through the court system to prevent the mother having the child. So, where is this girl now? Uh, she is now adult, and this is where it's interesting, and the mother cannot get near her because she has uh, contacts close to her who I will call a social service contacts. Let me be more specific. I had the pleasure of sitting in court with this mother when she was challenging what had been done to her daughter. Welcome back to On the Edge of Me, Theo Chalmers, and my special guest, Brian Gerrish. Uh, Brian, just before the break there, yes. we were talking about, you were sitting, we were talking about the, the, the child who was taken to a hospital in America by her mother. And then taken by social and services. And then grabbed in America yeah. by social services. Yeah. And then you were sitting in court with the mother. This is when presumably she was attempting to get... This is recently. Get, this was recently. Uh, um, last year. But uh, you say her daughter's an adult now. Yes. So what, she's 18, presumably? Or? Oh, she's over 18. Okay, she's over this is quite interesting because we ended up sitting in a court where there was a 
quasi-family court. What's that then? Well, we weren't too sure because um, uh, there were members of the public present in the court, but um, the judge appeared to want to steer the proceedings as if we were still dealing with a child. But what I was going to say, this is the key bit, is that in the court uh, where the mother conclusively showed that at the time her daughter was removed from her in America, the local authority did not have any lawful document uh, or arrangement to permit them to do that. So what they did was illegal and unlawful. Um, the mother had four witnesses who were prepared to testify that the council had broken the law. And what was interesting about the witnesses is that they were all local councillors for that council. And they were prepared to testify an oath what they knew about what had occurred at the time and also the fact, and uh, one of them wrote a particularly good statement in which he said, in his opinion, the council had broken the law. This is one of the councillors? Yep. Presumably, and was he an opposition councillor to the, to the party in power? Or? Um, no, as it happens, no. But mm, the key, but key point was that the judge would not allow the mother to call any of those four witnesses. And However, grounds? he didn't give any grounds. But he did allow the local authority to call two members of the social services department to testify against the mother. To say what about her? Well, well to challenge things that she said, um, to say that they took the right action with the daughter. So, so the local authority was allowed witnesses, but the mother wasn't allowed witnesses. OK, well, this does seem, of course, hugely unfair. But let's, uh, I've got a text here. How did the girl get to America? She must have had a passport. So why did the social security, sorry, the, the social services she did ha she, have to she, forge one? She, she was on her mother's passport. And oh, the, she was on her mother's passport. And the, the social services had to bring her back. They did. They flew her back. So they had to bring her back separately? Yeah. OK, that answers that question. Yeah. So... Um, when she was diagnosed with this Zellinger's, was it Zollinger's, Zollinger's disease in America, when they brought her back to uh, the UK, mm. when the, the social services brought her back, did they treat her for Zollinger's disease? No, initially they tried to convince the girl that um, she was imagining her pain. That it was psychosomatic? Yeah, I, I've got a note. Uh, this is one of a series of notes written by this little girl. And um, she's addressed this to an, um, her mam, as she calls her, mum her nan and her granddad. Yeah. She says, I am still in the same pain. I know you are doing your best to help me. I love and missing you all. Tell everyone and someone will help. Sorry, tell, tell everyone and someone will help me. Ask the papers for help, Mum, so the truth will come out. That is just absolutely right, heartbreaking, In here, isn't I've it? got a series of these letters. And in one of the letters, she actually says that the social workers have told her that she is not allowed to tell anybody she's in pain. She also says in one of the letters that they have also told her that she can't say that she still loves her mum. Well, that beggars belief, doesn't it? That's what kind of, what kind of people are these? Well, this is the very interesting thing, because when you hear it from one mother, or one child, where it's more fundamental, you start to find that there are many other mums and dads that have got this sort of evidence with notes uh, smuggled out from the children, where the children, uh, particularly when they're, they're, they're older, they're 10, 11, they are begging to come out, they know where they want to be, and their opinions are not taken into account, neither are the children brought into the courts, um, so let me just ask you this question. Well, so this child was snatched by the social services when she yeah. was 13, is that when? Uh, 12. When she was 12? Yeah. And then she was kept in pain? For quite a long period before they did treat her. They did eventually treat her yeah. while course, she was still in care. Indeed, and they treated her for Zollinger's. And they they, they only, treated her for Zollinger's disease? Yeah, and they only knew it was Zollinger because of all the effort for, 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 from the mother to actually find out what was wrong with her daughter. Now, what I wanted, what well, I, then didn't they apologise to the mother and said, here's your daughter back? Why, why would they apologise? 
Well, because they'd snatched the, the daughter on the basis well, no, that her mother was never faking made, her, in her illness. They've never made any apology. In fact, what they've consistently done is gone to court to deny that they ever did anything wrong. So this case you went to, what, yeah. was, what was the actual case trying to do? Trying to get, the mother, can't get possession the, the, of an the, adult. The mother, you? well, <laughs> this is, this, that case is particularly bizarre because um, the girl is now an adult, so family court ruling shouldn't apply. But any time the mother has tried to get near her daughter, rather strange things happen. And the net result is pressure is put back on the mother to keep her away. What sort of pressure? What pressure can they possibly bring? Um, well, on one occasion, a, another lady made an approach to the house in order to speak to the girl. I've got to be very... I may be going... Is she still living, what, with well, foster parents? If or? I just slow you down a bit, I, okay. have to get, I have to go slow on this because it's very easy for me to mention a name and I don't want to mention a name because that would cause, cause problems. No, of course, okay. and I sincerely don't well, want so that to happen. I just okay. need to just go a bit calmly on this. Okay. But in order to try and get the mother reunited with the daughter, another lady, a friend, went to call at the house where the daughter is, and she lives with some people linked to social services. Was she adopted by these people? Oh, she was, she was actually, um, she was actually cared for by some other people, but then as she came to the age of 16, she starts to live in a new location. So she comes out of a care environment and she's living in a house. So that, but she, was she fostered then, or was she in a it's home? It's not entirely clear. But all, all we know for certain is that the people who have stayed surrounding this young lady are connected with social services. And they didn't change her name? No. Or did they? No, they didn't change and her did name. And did they abuse her, apart from the fact they denied her the treatment that she so urgently required? Um, local people who met her, who have met the girl, and indeed her grandfather bumped into her in the street on one occasion, and he went to hug her, and the girl said to him, Grandad, don't touch me, don't touch me, because they'll know. Now, there is so much to what, what these cases, and the problem is I could spend two hours on this one case, but we are seeing where the children are turned against their own parents. A common trick, and this is often done on fathers, is the fathers are not told when there's an opportunity to visit the child. So that Naturally, they don't go because they don't know there's an opportunity to visit the child. Social services tell the child or say to the child, um, where's your dad? He hasn't come. Well, it's, now, it's, it's now, you know, 45 minutes. He's late. He hasn't come. He obviously can't be bothered with you. Right? <coughs> there's some... Apparently, there are some evil people, seriously are, evil we people. We are there. talking absolutely evil people. And it comes down to the business that the evidence is there to show what's going on, but you've got to get through the minefield of the secret courts. And this is where, at some stages, we move through this, we'll be asking why, why this is happening. Well, I've got a question but, here. Steve is asking, who orchestrates this and why? Well, and, hold on, and Denise in Cambridgeshire says, is this more common purpose action? Um, well, because of the programme tonight, we decided we're going we're gonna to go for the subject of what's happening to the children. Yeah. I, I don't want to go into detail about common purpose, but I can say that we are increasingly suspicious of common purpose's um, role within the public sector, including <coughs> social services, because, as I've said many times before, uh, there's, a t there's, a, there's a regular tendency that when you find common purpose, you find other problems. And since on my website, cpexposed.com, we've recently flagged up that two serious paedophiles have been involved with common purpose, uh, we, need to, we, we need to watch them. And again, I have to issue a warning that those are the opinions of my guests and not necessarily the opinions well, of this show no, or the station. Are, uh, the information I've just given you is correct because there are two paedophiles. We can name them because they've been in the press. One is James Rennie, who was leader of a gang in Scotland who were abusing children down to the age of months. And the other one is, uh, at the moment, moving through the, through the court process but has appeared in the um, uh, 
press in the Merseyside well, district. Well, if he's not convicted, we can't discuss him. Can I, I haven't, so I haven't mentioned it. I'm looking <laughs> after you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Can, I, can I just, um, just on the subject of what the children actually say, um, I, I've, I've read, um, I've read the... Well, you've read the letter from that From young the other girl. little girl. Yes. And which is heartbreaking. I, I have in front, of, heartbreaking. front of me another one, which I, I can show the camera. This is this is not a problem. Um, this is a letter that was found under the bed of two girls uh, before they were taken, six and ten at the time, I think. And essentially, uh, the, the old we think it's done by the older girl. She's she said, "I'm not going into care." Written several times, "Dear God, please stop these." Nasty, nasty social, social workers, workers taking, taking me away. away. And then she's written out the Lord's Prayer. Yes. Amen. And, and this is a very desperate little girl. And then her name now, is crossed out, I see. I'll, see. I'll tell you a little bit about the story. <coughs> um, uh, um, we had a couple where the mother had some mental issues to the extent that she was not treating the two girls well. Neither was the grandmother. And the mother's condition deteriorated until she was self-harming, and eventually she went on to set the house on fire. So in that instance, you would right. say it's a good thing to put the children in care, wouldn't well, it? Well, no, because there was a perfectly capable father. And okay. the girls indeed went to live with the father, and they were very, very happy with the father. But the mother, in her state, brought social services into the process, and social services took the girls away from the mother, as uh, correction, from the from father. The father. On, on what basis? What was on, that? on the basis that um, there, there was a risk of harm. And this is where you need to really understand how powerful social services are, because a social services worker can write a report in which they make and do make totally unsubstantiated accusations and that evidence is then used to take the child away. Now, I know that out there, there are going to be a lot of social services people who are finding this very difficult to listen to, and they'll be saying, that doesn't happen in my social services unit, and it may not do. But I will say to them, I'm afraid that the evidence is overwhelming. It is happening in many units right the way across the country. Are you saying that as far as they can concern the ends justify the means and if they've decided that a child is at risk or they need the revenue perhaps from having child well that's certainly a great incentive care. if you've got a council whose budget is tight and they know that they can make money by taking children into are we, care are we talking huge sums of money well for some of the bigger london councils i think one of them's had about two million two million pounds yeah just from putting children into yeah, care? absolutely. What about adoption? Do they, do they get more for adoption? Uh, I'm not sure on that, and, and this is where I will, I will happily state my limitations. There are other people who've done that sort of detail much better than I have. Where I believe that we've started to do something which other people haven't been doing is we're printing the stories in order to try and break through this secrecy. Well, Brenda in Hull is saying just one word, monsters, and I've got to say, Brenda... I'm well, not argue with you. Ab absolutely. But what is, what is very, very worrying is that you see a template with the actions. That there is, there's a family, an event happens. Maybe it's a dispute with a neighbour. Social services get involved. They write a report. The mother or the father will say the report arrived and it was totally inaccurate. But then we've got to deal with social services, but I don't want to deal with social services. But then they get the police involved, and then we have to attend the meetings. <clears throat> and then there is the attempt to take the children away. Isn't there also uh, something that happens to a lot of these parents where they're told they need to have a psychiatric assessment? Absolutely. Do you want to describe that for me? Um, well, um, the, the case uh, that I've mentioned with the mother self-harming, the father... Um, eventually had a psychiatric assessment written on him by a man he'd never met. Well, he never met him even for the assessment? No. It was just completely fabricated? Two, two girls were assessed, 
although they'd never had any problem, but the father was never directly in, in contact with the psychiatrist who wrote the assessment. And this psychiatrist was paid a big fee, presumably. Oh, I would imagine a very fat fee. And, it, of course, if he wants more of that work, and yeah. I, I also imagine, and, I, you know, I'm not mm. making any suppositions here, but I'm asking you yeah. the question, yeah. would you say it likely that the I psychiatrist realises that what is required from him is to say what the social services are paying his I fee? I would say it's very likely. A figure that was suggested to me for the, the annual value of money circulating through the family courts was 20 billion, 20 billion pounds. Per annum? Per annum. Well, that's, you know, that's an incentive to do yep. wrong, isn't it? Yeah. And what is interesting is that it isn't just a question that the children are taken away. There's often with it the fact that the mother and father, or the man and the woman, if they're partners, are played off against each other. And there have certainly been cases where the man has been told, well, if... if if your partner's going to keep the child, you need to split with her. So they actually break the family apart. Okay, well, is this, but this, is this about money? Or, you know? No, I believe this is something different. This is to do with out-and-out uh, -out social engineering. Well, okay, so you're accusing the government of having a master plan. I'm accusing the government of having a master plan, which is actually to undermine and destroy families. And For what end? Uh, because ultimately, if you look at police state type regimes, they want the children free of influence of their parents so the state can claim them. And that was going, that's been going on in China, it's been going on in East Germany, it's been going on in the Soviet Union, and it was certainly going on in Nazi Germany. So, when we look at the scale of this, you say this isn't something that's just happening in, um, we'll say, the southwest. I won't mention a county and embarrass any. It isn't something that's just going on in the southwest. It's happening right the way across England, Wales, Ireland, Scotland. So there's an agenda running. And the, the evidence of the cases shows you this pattern. And then you have to say, these people can't do these things coincidentally. They must have been taught how to do some of these things. You see, p people will say that, you know, that starts to sound like a big conspiracy theory, doesn't it? You know, you yeah. can understand individual councils doing wrong yeah. for money. Yeah. But then when you say it's a master plan of the government... Well, I, I can say it's a master plan because I have the privilege of sitting here knowing the cases and if we start to let's start to add some numbers there's a very brave lady who's no longer in the country at the moment in order to protect the young child um, she's already had a young son taken away from her and she knew that if she stayed in UK they were going to take her youngest child so she's moved out of the country and she's another one of the very brave people working to try and expose what's going on. Um, she told me about three weeks ago that she's now up to 135 cases on her books. And she is one of, of a very large number of, of people campaigning now. Um, we're certainly talking uh, 100 key campaigners. So this is where we know that we, we're ultimately looking at thousands of cases. Well, there was one now, case recently, wasn't there, where the family fled to Ireland, where the woman was told, even though she's got a partner as well, that, that she was yeah. too stupid to have a baby, Well, even though she was pregnant, of course. Well, this, this, of course, is very interesting, because is that about money? Was it just simply that there was another baby that could be taken for money? Um, or are you now seeing the state sort of starting to prescribe whether you're allowed to have children? Are you too stupid to have children? Well, am I too stupid? Well, that's a question, but a key question is who is entitled to ask that question? Well, no, and who is entitled to decide? <laughs> no, or, or to decide, yeah. yeah. Okay, I'll give you that. But um, these, these incidents have made the papers, and in fact, you know, if we take somebody like Camilla Cavendish, she's written quite a lot in the, um, 
in the Times on this thing, and she's clearly getting very concerned. But at the moment, what I'm going to say is that many of the journalists who are beginning to get interested in these child cases aren't seeing it on a broad enough front. They rather regard it as a terrible case here and a terrible case there. They are not starting to say, hang They're on. They're not joining minute. the dots. They're joining the dots up. Okay, I've got, I'm getting several texts that are saying similar sort of things, so I think we need to, we need to yeah. sort this out now. There's somebody calling themselves Mr. McWhirter. It says, hi Theo, Brian is using these cases in an abhorrent manner to pursue his vendetta against the Labour Party. Do you have a political agenda? Uh, I don't have any political allegiance. I'm not a member of any party. I will not be a member of any party. And if this gentleman reads uh, the UK column or listens to any of my talks, including the most recent ones, he will discover that I am equally scathing about the Tory party and the Lib Dems. And if you go to ukcolumn.org, you can read the UK column. Yeah. So after this show... And I will, I will also say that a wonderful thing, because we're going to be upbeat towards the end of this programme. I do hope so. <laughs> but a wonderful thing that's happening at the moment is I can tell you that information being provided to us and help we are getting is coming from cross-party. And if, if you want to talk Labour Party, I can tell you that old Labour people, councillors and, and uh, Labour Party members, are salt-of-the-earth people who are helping us to try and expose what's going on. I think it has to be acknowledged that there are lots of good people. Absolutely, yeah. But a lot of good people are asleep. And also, with this subject... It's, some of it can be so harrowing, people just don't want to go near it. If you start to get into the cases where the children have been horribly abused, um, there are a lot of people, they just can't deal with it. They switch off. They say, I can't deal with it. They go away. Well, I, I, I've got to say, I can understand that. It yeah. is harrowing. But we've got to confront it. We've got to confront it. It's no good saying, well, I've read something in the, you know, about a little girl and she was horribly abused and there's no justice, and I'm going to go and sit on my bottom. Well, I, I can't do that. You do naturally think that if there is clear prima facie, prima facie evidence that a child is being abused, that child will be properly cared for yeah. by the state, you know, yeah. by the local council or by social services yeah. or whoever. Yeah. But that doesn't well, seem we, to be necessarily, necessarily the case. For it, it isn't the case. We are not saying, and I'll come back to this point, we are not saying that children are not taken into care and cared for properly by very caring um, carers or, or adoptive parents. That is happening. But what we are saying is that alongside that, we are getting so many of these other cases that one, people have to be warned, and two, we have to do something to assist the parents. Now, one of the cases that we were asked to help on, which we've published in the paper, concerns... And, and there is a question is whether Sorry. it's actually a proper paper as well as online. Well, it is, isn't it? A proper... You've well, got a copy of it there. There I've it is. Got a, I've got a hard copy of it here. How is it paid for? Many people ask. Who pays for it? It's all paid by voluntary donations, and they, those come in from across the country, and some of them from overseas, because this paper goes out to the States and Australia and New Zealand and a few other places. And what is interesting... Um, is that uh, we, we pick up comments from overseas which mirror comments from, you know, here. So, for example, uh, particularly in America, people will start talking about these child cases. In America? Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. you mean there are similar cases? In there America? seem to be, yeah. Well, well I'm all, not... all about money as well. And... Um, well, yes, basically, yeah. And in other yeah. countries in Europe, perhaps? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So if, if, I, if I just come on to the, the, the case in Scotland, um, we were called by a mother, and it's the old story because she tells you an un unbelievable story in the beginning about a young da Down syndrome girl that was raped and abused over a number of years by a paedophile gang. The mother... I'm sorry, Brian. What? We're going to go for another, another break, break now. Okay. Once again, if you'd like to text in your questions or comments for Brian Gerrish, please do so now. See you very soon. Welcome back to On the Edge with me, Theo Chalmers, and my special guest, Brian Gerrish. Brian, I know we were just talking about this paedophile case uh, yeah. in Scotland, but I think before we do, we just need to briefly go back to that case of the woman 
who had the two children that were that set Jeez. the house on yeah. fire. Yeah. So yeah. what what happened in that case? Because somebody texted in and said, so the, so the woman who set the house yeah. on fire, she shouldn't obviously get the, ha the children back or something like that. Well, what what actually happened in that case is the <clears throat> the girls went initially to live with their father and were very happy and the mother mother was was suffering ill health yeah there was um, a psychiatric assessment of the father yeah in his absence social services are in the psychiatric assessment of the father the girls were then taken off the father and they were given to two ladies as as uh, carers and in fact those two ladies looked after the girls extremely well and the girls settled and the father had access and it was all working okay obviously he was very sad he hadn't got custody but he accepted the situation well even though there was a completely false report on him well people get trapped in the system and and what do they do they get to the, some of them get to the stage where they're so angry they climb on judges roofs well this but, is this is fathers for justice and yeah and this is why people these, like that, they dress well, up like batman right. well, let's answer the question but this is why some people get so aggressive because they get trapped in a system where there is no way they can get justice and this is where they start to head towards the demonstrations but the two girls were taken from the father with the help of a psychiatric report on him and he was never assessed on a one-to-one -one basis in any case he'd never done anything wrong the two girls were put in the care of two ladies who treated them very well the girls settled and then out of the blue social services appeared and took the girls away from the two ladies and gave them back to their mother the woman who'd set fire to the house absolutely and, and was she reassessed or something? and mistreated the children I don't understand. You know, the father does nothing and is judged to be incapable of looking after the children. Mm. The mother clearly has well, been incapable. I'm not saying that she's not. Right. She's beyond redemption. I'll, I'll come back to the Scotland one. But let's follow this thread about how these cases start. A lady calls me from from Ireland, which I said on the west coast of Ireland, and she's lost. Um, I think it's two children. Now, I only spoke to her last week, but the pattern is there. It's very interesting. How did the problem start with social services? Well, she gave birth in hospital, and she was, she was in hospital, little baby girl, and one day her partner is there with her, and he said, I'll change the baby. Now, he, he'd changed children before, because he'd well, had... Change the nappy, you yeah, mean? he'd had other children. While he's changing the nappy... A member of the social services comes in and asks what he's doing and he said I'm changing the nappy and there was a strange questioning of why he was changing the baby's nappy and that escalated into the police being brought in and that was the start of social services getting involved and subsequently taking the lady's children away from her what well, all of her children not uh, just this uh, one two, two of them did children. she already have one? She, she had a child. She, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm hesitating slightly because this is a new case for me. I believe that she already had another child. I don't know whether that was a boy or a girl. So because the, the, the father of the child wanted to change its mm. nappy, mm. and that's a crime, is it, now? Well, it's, very, uh, it's quite frequent that the first... Um, contact with social services is over something which appears quite sim quite bizarre bizarrely simple maybe a row with a neighbor and then social services I have I have one uh, lady I know her case very well because she she's um, done a lot of work for us her story is that she came home um, came to a house home I think she'd been shopping one evening and um, was surprised to see a police car parked outside of her house and as she got level with the car, the passenger window was wound down, and she was even more surprised to see a lady she knew as a friend sitting in the front seat of the car. And the lady said to her, uh, I'll call her Jane, said to Jane, the lady that we know, Ah, oh, there you are, Jane. We were worried about you. We thought you'd committed suicide. She said, What? And the woman repeated it. And that was the start of social services getting involved with her and her family and subsequently her two children were taken away from her and given into the custody of the father. Why did this 
neighbour think that she had committed suicide? Well, uh, ultimately, the neighbour appears to have been part of concocting a complete fabricated story in order to help get social services involved. But why? Did she not like this woman or something? Well, the, these are where you often never get an answer because no rational person would do this. <clears throat> Were the children left at home or something? Was she, had she gone out and left her children at home well, unattended? Or? Uh, not, um, not to cause any uh, problem, and in any case, the children were old enough to be left at home. A daughter at that stage was 15, I think. <laughs> okay, let's yeah. go back to the Scottish. Well, the, the Scottish one we, we've, we've printed because it was just so incredible. So if I can just hold that up for the camera, um, it concerns a, a, Downs, a little Down syndrome girl called Holly Gregg. And presumably the mother and the daughter and the, are happy to have their photographs. Uh, absolutely. They, yes. they are more than happy because they've been trying to get the truth out about this story for some time and they, uh, they are delighted that we've printed it. And I can also say that, that Holly herself is uh, calming down and reacting better because she now knows that people believe what she said. I understand now, that the BBC was doing a programme about this in Scotland. Absolutely. The BBC started to work with the, with the, uh, with the mother on this case uh, in order to do an investigative programme, and then suddenly they withdrew their support. But let me tell you the story about the case first. Please do. Uh, the mother discovered that family members were abusing Holly. Uh, the girl suddenly started to tell her mum that she was being used sexually by members of the family. And then subsequently, she named with great accuracy a string of other people, which included a sheriff, they included a police officer. A they, sheriff in Scotland? Uh, in is. Scotland, as a, well, he's a, he's a magistrate, yeah, a JP, basically, okay. I think is the correct thing. But um, a police officer, social workers, carers who were actually appointed to care for Holly. And she, she described in great detail what was done to her, where it was done, who was present, and in many cases uh, there were um, men and women and other children present. So this, this is paedophile abuse within a swinging environment. It's, it, I've got to say here that it is only recently that I've become aware that, that women are paedophiles too because of that case well, with the nursery where they were taking pictures. Well, news, a lot of the newspapers will have you believe that the only paedophiles are, are sort of dirty old men in raincoats and that's absolutely not true. It's right through the structure of society. This is why we know uh, and, and evidence has shown that we have everybody from, from uh, members of parliament, judges, senior military people who are perverted in this way. It is not the case that it's simply some old man on the street corner. And the other thing, and I was shocked to learn this as well, is that the percentage of women involved is very high. I don't believe it's as high as 50%, but according to one police officer, it's certainly around 40, 45%. And in many cases, the women can be the worst of the abusers. Um, so there's some facts here which are not very nice. So no. the girl recounts in great detail what was done to her, where it was done, which house, who was present, what the relationship between people were. Were they husband and wife? Did they have their children there? In, and Holly has been described accurately as a reliable witness. By whom? Uh, by the assessments that were done by the police at the start of this incident. Investigation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. But no action was taken by the judicial system in Scotland. Why? Well, let me tell you the story and then we'll ask the question why. Okay. The mother tried to fight to get the police to do a full investigation, to take it to court, to get action. And she got blocked and stalled and blocked. And then one day, uh, she'd gone downstairs from her flat to empty the rubbish bin. And she found, to her surprise, a group of people standing outside the entrance to her flat, which included a police officer. She didn't take any notice. She emptied the bin. And then as she went to go back into her flat, um, the police officer said to, uh, said to her, uh, sorry, said to her, Mrs. Gregg, um, can we come in? And she said, I, I was surprised by the number of people, but I let them into the flat. 
The moment they got in the flat, she was forced to the ground. She had her trousers pulled down and a hypodermic needle stuck in her backside. And when she woke up, she was in a psychiatric unit. And she was in a psychiatric unit for several days until she got herself out by protest and compliance. And then she immediately did something very, very sensible. She went and had a psychiatric assessment. What, on her own bat? On her own bat, and she got a clean bill of health. Yes. And then she tried to get this case brought to justice. She so uh, what grounds was she told? That why was she told? What, what excuse would, did they give that well, they'd they seized her in this the, way? They obfuscate. This unlawful way. I mean, they obfuscate, and that means that it's all rather woolly blurry. Yes, we're going to interview some people. Times go past, weeks go past. Have you done anything? Well, yes, we've interviewed this person, although that wasn't actually true. And so the time ticks. It's always to delay, to stall. It's done very in a smokescreen way. Now, eventually, this lady was able to ram through that something should be done, and I've got to jump. She is awarded um, criminal injuries payment. What, for being seized and, and sent no, to the No, for the daughter. For the daughter? Yeah. But how can you well, award... Well, for her daughter being uh, how can you habitually award, raped. Yeah, how can you award criminal injuries if, if there hasn't been a criminal case? Are they trying to pay her off, do you think? Mm, we would think so. Now... This lady, Again, I have to say that is your opinion, and well, it can't be the opinion of this Reviewers program. can decide for themselves. I, I can only help get the facts across. So this lady continues to fight. The BBC dropped the case. Now, in a what about the legal case? What about the prosecution? Nothing happens. The police don't do anything. Grampian police don't do anything. What about the procurator fiscal? She or? doesn't do anything. Nothing happens, and in fact, the pro procurator fiscal appears in a uh, uh, in a Telegraph article dated um, 26 of May 2001, where she had to apologise to another 10-year-old girl after uh, sexual abuse. It, it collapsed. There was no case because of the time it took to come to court. And then apparently the judge said that the um, because of so that it took so long, even though there doesn't seem to be a statute of limitations. Yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. Um, they, they didn't need to be the a judge case. Threw it and, out because it yeah. takes so long to get yeah. to court. Yeah. yeah. And so isn't this same judge somehow? Well, this is the this? same procurator fiscal who at the moment doesn't want to make a statement on her involvement with the case. Um, but the mother could not get it through the system. This, this is where the, the mothers or the fathers pull their hair out because they're trying to explain to other people that you, they come up against a wall of silence. People who should say, yes, Mrs. Gregg, come and sit down. Let's get the facts. Let's interview this little girl. And we now need to go and interview other people. They never do it. And the case is stalled. Now, eventually, she called us, and we've printed the story again. But in the meantime, something very significant has happened, is that uh, whilst the case was going on to do with Holly, and Greg's brother was found dead in a burnt-out car, and the claimed reason for that was smoke inhalation. Now, subsequently, the family have got hold of a copy of the autopsy, and the autopsy shows that he was severely beaten. So... So is this a warning to her, do you think? Well, no, because Holly says that at a particular time, Anne Gregg's brother walked in and saw her father abusing, them, uh, abusing her. So it would appear that the brother was silenced. Now, this is an allegation I at the moment again have to because say this is not the opinion of this we, station. We need the police to investigate. And I think the police are going to have to investigate again because that autopsy report is very clear. He died in a car. That the car was set on light, but when he was in that car, he'd all already suffered injuries. If you're going to kill yourself, you don't beat yourself up first. Well, he'd, he'd also it's... had alcohol in his... Uh, stump, stomach, whiskey, which he never drank, although he was a Scotsman. Well, you don't have a to... A Scot. You don't have to drink right? Scotch whiskey 
We're now probably, <laughs> we've got Scott. people listening and thinking this can't be true, this can't be true. But if they it is like log film, on it? It to like the UK column site, they can not only read the article, they can watch a video where a gentleman called Robert Green des describes in great detail what actually happened. UKcolumn.org right. is now, the same. Now, on a template basis... And actually people who go there can also ask for copies of this paper, can't they? Yes, they can if they phone us in the Plymouth office. Um, All the details Go to the website. UKcolumn.org, OK. Yeah. yeah. Now, on a template basis that this lady wasn't able to get the authorities to take action on what had happened. And um, I, can tell, I can tell you um, without any problem, because uh, Holly and her mother would approve of me telling you this, uh, the physical proof that the girl was horribly abused and raped is there. So we're, we're, we're not just on one young girl's word, the physical damage to her is there. But I'm not going to be more specific on no, camera. No, I don't think we need to be. Actually, I've okay. got a very good text here from Gwen in Bradford. And she says, this is really <laughs> very good question. She says, was baby P left in place delib... Oh, I cannot believe it. My screen has just gone blank. OK, well, I can remember it. Was baby P left in place deliberately, 60-plus visits, in order for people to demand more social services intervention? Well, I don't know, and I have to say I think about that case a lot, um, because obviously it was so horrible and so serious. But again, I say to, you, say, to, say to the audience that what was going on? Have we really heard the truth about what was happening there? And why is it that we are seeing people in charge of social services on these vast salaries? Because in the old days, people who were doing the caring, many of them would say, I don't earn much, but I do it because I want to do it. Now, I'm not suggesting that social, service, social services workers should be on low or poor pay. But what I'm saying is we seem suddenly to have gone to the other extreme, where people in charge of the whole outfit are earning huge money. And to me, that says that their loyalty is to the person paying the paycheck and not to the people at the bottom of the pile. So I, I'm deliberately being a little bit guarded here because I, I personally don't want to comment on Baby P case. I have my own opinion. I haven't done a lot of research on it. But I, I would say we are not seeing the truth coming out on that case. Well, that's, that's what I would okay. say. Yeah. I mean, the other thing that, that seems to be fairly... Um self-evident in these cases that you've yeah. described at least is that the parents have no fair way of getting justice they have no fair way of getting justice and the children this is the bit when the children are old enough to speak for themselves the children um, again in here I've got letters where the where the girl is saying please can I go into court and speak to the judge she wasn't even allowed to speak to the judge and give her own opinion of who she wanted to live with and then you start to learn something else. And this is against all natural justice. Absolutely. It? But the reason that you are sitting, and you are looking quite surprised at what well, I'm saying... I'm, I'm, right? I'm horrified, Well, the reason frank. you're surprised is because you cannot read about it in the paper because it is all suppressed under the family court secrecy laws. This is how the dirty deed is being done. And I have come to the conclusion, and people out there can smile or laugh or take the mickey, I have come to the conclusion that the courts, the social services system set up with a secret court system was done deliberately to allow the state to take children away. Now, I'm going to come back to that, but I want to come on to this business that you have a mother who's discovered something's wrong. It can be the father. I'm going to stick with mothers because there's more of them come to me. <clears throat> discover something wrong and then they can't get anything done about it. So I have another lady, she happens to be French, married to a Frenchman but they were living in England. Mm -hmm. She discovers that he is abusing the two young girls. And I'm, I am going to say that you were able to see some of that evidence with me earlier. I can't share it with the audience. Um, he was abusing the girls and taking photographs of them. And so eventually, when it got so bad, she went to social services. Social services become involved. And then what happens very quickly 
is that the mother is the problem. To the extent that they're talking about, can she have contact with her daughters? And this, of course, puts under extreme stress and the stress of the husband abusing them. So eventually this lady is getting depressed and ends up on medication. Not surprising. So we had a situation where all a mother did was went to defend her daughters and then the mother is treated as though she's an equal abuser. It's counterintuitive, but, isn't it? Yeah, she's the yeah. one complaining. Yeah. yeah. Now, <laughs> what subsequently happened was the mother, who's a very strong lady, regrouped herself, got herself in a better mental state, fought a case, got custody of the two girls in a London court case with permission to take them back to France. So she moved back to France with a big sigh of relief, thinking that they could now set up and start new life together. After a couple of months, she got a knock on the door one day, and it's French social services. And they say that she's got to take the girls into a French uh, court just to see the judge, to see that everything's okay. And the French lady said, I knew what was going to happen. The moment the girls were taken into that court building, they were snatched from her. They were held in a children's facility in France for a couple of weeks. And then they were handed over to English social services, who handed them back to custody of their father, who by that time was working with other paedophiles. Now, I will tell you something else on the unbelievable side. That man had in his possession a modified starting pistol with ammunition, which the mother reported to the police. When you say modified starting pistol, you say modified, that it was modified to fire. To fire real bullets. Correct. And which the mother reported to the in, police. In a file here, I have the receipt from the police for, for that firearm. Now, I think I'm correct in saying that offence alone, you are talking up to five years in prison. I think it's mandatory, isn't it? I, I thought it was mandatory, but not in this case, because no action was ever taken against the father. So a father who was an abuser, who photographed the girls, um, later joined with other friends, and that was known, but the girls were given back. So what you see is a, a vindictive, vicious twist that the innocent mother then becomes a victim, and she is victimized by the system. And she has not only now not got custody of her daughters, she doesn't even have visiting rights. She can't even see her daughters. Does she know where they are? She does know where they are. Did she not go back to court and say, I want my daughters back? I She's been back to court repeatedly. And all that happens is they're led round in a circle. Because what happens overwhelmingly and if there are legal people out there, I know some of you are good because you, you're kind enough to work with us, but you find that the solicitors and barristers work behind the back of the family. And what do they do? Well, what they seem to do is find an excuse for a follow-up court case and a follow-up court case. And each court case, they're netting 20, 30, 40, 50,000 pounds. We have got to get adults in this country understanding that children are being abused on a large scale through the public systems, and at the moment no child is protected by their own parents because social services have the power to intervene on any family. This is wrong. Well, we did have a, a text at the start that said, um, you don't have to register your child. Um, and and well, if you don't register your child, then they can't take that child, is that correct? Uh, that, is, um, that is a procedure which is being put forward by the free men movement. Which is, yeah, tpuc.org. TPUC, because we know that um, a lot of the actions appear to be strictly linked to the birth certificate. Now, I am very interested in all avenues that people are trying in order to break this system open. Mm. And if, um, if this business of not registering children produces results, I think we should look at it. But, but it also, each individual parent or guardian has got to take the responsibility on themselves as to what action they take. It's not for me to suggest that they should do any of that. But I, I know that there are people looking at quite radical action as to how you stand up against a state 
thinking it can walk into your house and take your children. So the first thing we've got to do is get people to understand the scale of the problem, the scope of it, and the fact the evidence is there. And the sheer injustice. And the sheer horror and the injustice of it. And then, armed with that, something natural starts to happen. A lot of people have been trying to fight this on a case-by-case -case system. And all that happens is the system sucks them in and runs them round in a circle, and they wear them out, usually. What we need are for large groups of people to come together, to share their stories and experience and evidence, and ultimately we need to see class actions, groups of people challenging the state, where there is a large amount of circumstantially corroborating evidence. I suppose, yeah, well, if you did a class action, it's very different. It's very hard to break down the individuals within that class action, because you could say, oh, this person well, was abusive, or this person was, a, the, you know, was under psychiatric The establishment chaos. invariably victimises the parents, and the, th the way that it does that is by alienating them. It says, you must not talk about this case to your family, you mustn't talk to your friends. So the state works to isolate the mother or the father or both parents, and then when they're isolated, they can't fight. So what we've got to do is join them together. Now, a problem a little while ago was that there were some brilliant groups out there who were doing great work, but they were working in their own little field. They were fighting for fathers, or they were fighting as mothers. And often there was antagonism between the two groups. And this is where I say, my brain starts to say, was that antagonism created? What do you mean by... By, by the state, yes, by manipulating the groups. Now, since we've been putting out the information and evidence and the idea that this isn't an isolated incident in one or two authorities. We are seeing something nasty being driven from central government. Mm. What's happening is those groups are beginning to feel more comfortable about working together. And I am, I am really enthusiastic at what we've started to see happening over, I'm going to say, the last four months because not only are we getting calls from groups talking about how they're working with other groups, we're also getting more and more whistleblowers. And, and I would like on camera to thank people in the police force and social services and local authorities who are calling us saying, not only are you right, this is what's going on inside my, uh, inside my authority or my force or whatever. Because ultimately, the testimonial of the whistleblowers is going to be the final piece of the uh, jigsaw to, prevent the to present the evidence as to what's going on. And the other thing is that bringing people together in numbers means that the politicians, and I have to say to you, of the gentleman who wants to protect the Labour Party, I'm not really interested in any parties, we are seeing an absolute disgraceful avoidance of this issue by politicians. They will refuse to answer letters. They will often use the excuse, the problem isn't in my constituency, so therefore I'm not going to deal with it. So we can have a child being raped, and a politician is not going to do anything because there's a gentleman's code of conduct in Parliament that I don't tread on the toes of another MP. We've got MPs abusing their expenses, lying, taking us to war on false statements, they will not go near protection of children. Now, I believe most of them are, are absolute cowards, I'm going to use that expression, but there are one or two who are beginning to pay attention now, and I think that provided... Well, I, I interviewed John Hemming on this program who, who is a uh, Liberal Democrat MP who is trying to do something about Well, he, ha he has been trying to do things, but I, I would say to Mr Hemming, you've done a lot of good work, but please will you now come out of the trenches and start actually fighting? Because okay. I, I have to say, I, I find, I don't want to criticise the good work that he's done, but I think, come on, let's, let's get these people together and let's use the words, let's challenge the government. 
let's challenge the ministers who are running children's schools and families. Well, I think the idea of a class yeah. action is probably yeah. quite a good well, one. Well, the other thing that we're doing, and we've got it advertised in here on the Holly page. Now, we've got a provisional date for April. We are looking to... It's advertised on page three here under Holly. Fighting child stealing by the state. We want to put together a conference where we bring together families and of course the first thing that happens when the families mix is their confidence goes up because they realize they're not not alone and they share their experiences and they, and they find their out how common presumably yeah. yeah so we want to get these people together we already know that there are some of these parents who want to speak they're they they've got the right material they're not frightened of public speaking they've got the evidence they've done their homework and they are prepared to get up on stage and talk about what was happening. And the moment they do, what is going to happen is all the other people are going to come out of the woodwork. So whilst I've taken, I think, the viewers on a pretty interesting journey, and if, if there are some of them out there still thinking, this isn't happening, I'm just going to say to you again, it is. But we can now see how we can break out of the antagonism and start bringing the groups together. Interestingly enough, what we're doing is being watched very carefully by people in other countries. And I'd like to mention a Dutch lady called Roly Post who worked for the EU. And she came to the conclusion, she's written a book on it. She came to the conclusion that she was watching the European Union starting to open up child trafficking with a system which meant that if a child was taken for adoption in Newcastle, that child could be, within two days, given to parents in, pick somewhere. Romania? Romania, south of Italy, wherever you want to go. So they know, she knows, she's done a lot of work, she's been threatened, she's had death threats, so she's on the right track that the European Union is looking to just open up state borders to the movement of children. So when people say, you can't be serious, there's a political ideology behind what's happening. I'm saying the evidence is building and building, that's exactly what's happening. And we should be asking ministers in blunt, black and white terms for an explanation as to what's really going on. It's like breaking mm. our society, isn't it? Absolutely. Well, it's like breaking mm. our society, isn't it? Absolutely. Well, we have Mr. Ed Balls, MP. He is an attendee of the Bilderberger movement. I have printed the letter from him proving this is the case. The Bilderberg movement was first chaired by Prince Bernard of the Netherlands, mm -hmm. who was a Nazi supporter. And we have a senior politician attending Bilderberg meetings to discuss policy. The Bilderberg organization stated in writing, everybody attends as a private individual, but Mr. Ed Balls, attended in his formal capacity and charged the taxpayer. And we've just printed the letter. Now the question the viewers should be asking is, Mr. Balls, what were you actually discussing with these people? Yeah, at our expense. Yeah, at our expense. Well, surely yeah. we should be party to it then, shouldn't I we? I think we should, yes. But it's funny, we talked about Bilderbergs last week, actually, on this yeah. show. It's coming up rather a lot. Well, but... because people need to ask the questions. What is Bilderberger? And again, there's an article in the UK column on this, um, if I can, if you bear with me, I can just find it, I hope. UKcolumn.org, if you want to get a copy. If you, anybody out there still doesn't believe we're telling the truth, if you go to page 12, there's an article called Bilderberg Club of Traitors, and it talks about the fact that uh, when Margaret Thatcher went to the Bilderbergers and she disagreed with their policies towards supranational uh, lism or getting rid of nation states, she was quickly deposed as Prime Minister. And this article points out that attendance and, and agreement with Bilderberg policies is affectionately... And here are the letters, if you don't believe us on what we're saying about Mr. Ed Balls, here are the letters showing on what capacity he was attending. We need to get people motivated, so if we do it and we get the truth, the truth is the weapon, we can start to correct our society but there's something very nasty going at it at the moment. I've got to say, I think that, you know, uh, in terms of the truth, you know, the, you, if, you, if you always speak the truth, you can never be attacked. You never have to remember what you said last time, do you? That is, no. that is a, an absolute... No.
But Facts. I assure you, I wouldn't ever sit on your couch here in front of the cameras talking unless we'd done our homework. And we always do our homework, and we're always document-based. So, I mean, OK, do, do you think, then, that uh, the work that you're doing, the work that other people are doing, is going to make a difference? Or it do you is, think, I mean, you've is, got, if what you're saying is true, difference. I think it's important to say this, if what you're saying is true, that the powers are reined against you are so... Huge it's and not powerful. me. They're not reined against well, they're me. Again, because they're reined against the people who want to do something yeah, about but it. Yeah, but the numbers of people who want to do something are growing all the time. All the initiatives that we and other groups have put forward, whether it's the Free Men Movement or whether it's the British Constitution Group or, or it's the Lawful Rebellion Movement, which we're encouraging people to do, which is to stamp your actions with lawful rebellion. That's peaceful. But we are rebelling. We've had enough. We're saying enough's enough. All of those. Well, there's a movement in America, isn't there? There's tea. Tea parties tea they party. called over there. This and is of course, taxed the... enough already. It's absolutely for, apparently. But thousands of people are coming out on the streets in America and challenging their senators. None of it's being reported on the BBC. Mm -hmm. We need to get the same movements going here. And the, our problem now is every time we get bigger and more people, the phone calls keep coming in. And, and you say, how do you cope with it? So I am very, very optimistic that this year we're seeing the turning point. The whistleblowers are key. When, you, when the phone rings or a little note appears or you're in contact with somebody and they start telling you what's happening inside the police and the fact that the police are getting very concerned uh, as to how they're being trained and how they're treating the public, you know something's beginning to turn. Mm. Um, and and uh, uh, I'm, not, I'm not just sort of giving you a sort no, of pat on well, the head here, but talk, talk this you, station has, you, has got a very, fu a very important function well, very because other so. TV stations will not deal with this sort of material. No, that's true. But you say things are ch changing. I see you've got today's papers or some of them here. Do yeah. you know, quickly, we've got only a minute or so left, but well, you mentioned earlier that a lot of things seem to be all happening I, at once. I, dis I stopped, as you know... Uh, top up with petrol on, on the way up and I just looked on the forecourt and the papers, the front pages I thought were just extraordinary so I bought several. You've got MI5 and Whitehall and, and torture cover up. Well this, is, this is the a daily... picture of 9-11. Yeah, but, but if, we, if we just do it at the same time. We've got this fantastic picture of 9-11. Why this is, is it, in all the papers. All the papers. Why is it there? I'm not sure. Is it there to remind us of terrorism? Or is it to try and convince us that this building just collapsed due to a fire? And I was... Well, we've got a program in two weeks where we're going to be talking well, about that, so um, that might be some I, fun. I've got to say that most people who go to sea get trained in firefighting, and um, the thing you learn pretty quickly is that aviation fuel and carbonaceous uh, material does not, does not cause a steel ship to suddenly melt and, stink, and sink. So it certainly is going to bring down a building of this of this scale. Well, even if it did, it wouldn't bring it down at free so fall speed, my, would it? My nautical it common sense says somebody's telling me a pack of lies about what went on. But this is interesting. We now live in Britain, and we're dealing with torture of people. Now, who's going to pay? Is it Mr Miliband? He's in charge of that department, I think. Who is actually going to be brought to justice? And sadly, Brian, we've only, had, gonna... we've only had time to look at one paper, because that is all we've got okay. time for. Thank you to everyone for watching our special two-hour show and for those who texted. And thanks to my very special guest, Brian Gerrish. If you want more information, why not visit ukcolumn.org and cpexposed.com. You can see Brian Gerrish speak at the upcoming Alternative View 4 conference in London between the 26th and the 28th of March. Uh, the Edge Media Forum page for this show is at edgemediatv.com where you can post comments or questions. Next week, we'll be back with yet another exciting show that might even change your life. Until then, remember, they're watching you, watching us, watching them. Cheerio.